This morning, the message is entitled, The Appetite is Never Filled. The Appetite is Never Filled. Now, goldfish are known to eat a lot. In fact, they won't stop eating even if they're full. And because of this, sometimes their intestines can can become blocked and they can die as a result. Now, in human beings, there's a syndrome called the Prader-Villi syndrome. And those who have it, they too never get full. They'll eat anything, you know, from garbage, raw meat, even leather shoes, and this will lead to complications. There's also pica, where people will not only think, eat things that resemble food, but they will eat things which are inedible, and this leads to complications, which leads to death. Now, similarly, our appetites for things can also be very voracious. And the reason for that is our sinful nature. And this can lead to severe complications. And as you know, I'm not referring only to food. I'm referring to things. I'm referring to ideas. I'm referring to, to various goals that people want to have. So what does it take to satisfy us? What does it take? And And this is what we see in this chapter. You know, we also ask ourselves, what does it take to satisfy us? You know, it's such a Singaporean thing. Wherever you are, be it in Singapore or wherever you are in the world, before you finish a meal, you're always talking about the next one. If you're eating at this restaurant and you're saying, oh, this is good, but the other restaurant down the road, they've got something I want to try. You know, this is a very Singaporean thing where, where Our our appetites are never filled, and this even extends to work, right? We finish a project, we finish a sale, or we've dropped someone off, and we're always looking for the next thing, even though we may not necessarily need to. And Solomon recognized this, and he said in verse 7, all the labor of man is for his mouth, but yet the appetite is not filled, What we do, what we gain, it does not always satisfy us. We're not filled. And so Solomon explores this spiritual disease in three ways. Firstly, he explores the common goals that we seek to fill our appetites, the common goals. Secondly, he explores why our appetites cannot be filled. And thirdly, he explores how our appetites can be filled. So firstly, he explores the common goals that we seek in order to fill our appetites. Now, in chapter 5, Solomon uh, dealt with how God gives us good things like money and how we can legitimately enjoy these things, but we often cannot, we often will not, we're not satisfied with them. And so chapter 6 is a continuation So what we saw in chapter 5, in the last part at least, was a starter, was a taster, and in chapter 6, Solomon expands on the idea. And here, he lists down common goals. You know, we think, if only we had more of this, if only we had more of that, if only I had, you know, one more degree, if only I had, you know, one more uh, sandwich, if I only had one more of something, I would be filled. But Solomon is basically saying here, right, and it's a warning, if we refuse to be satisfied by what we have, then we will never be satisfied with more. Our appetite will never be filled. And so what are some of these common goals? As he did in chapter 5, he starts with wealth. He starts with riches. But he adds on another thing. He adds on honor, respectability. All right? Now, the first part of verse 2 says, A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth. So some people have wealth, great wealth. You know, they have enough food. They have spare change. They have housing. Uh, But some people also have honor. They have respectability. They have a good reputation, right? So these are the things that satisfy us. As long as I have what I need, if I have more, that's excellent. If I'm not a criminal, I've got a good reputation. You know, these are common goals that people have. 
right? I mean, kids, maybe your parents are even telling you, don't grow up to be a prisoner, huh? Don't be a criminal. Don't be this. If you're not studying hard enough, you'll be this or that. And so we grow up with this idea, these goals that we have. Now, another goal is family and children. The first part of verse 3 says, If a man beget a hundred children and live many years, so that the days of his years be many. So here it speaks about a man having as many as a hundred children. Now, Solomon may or may not be taken literally here. We do know, at least for him, he had many children. He had, you know, 700 wives, 300 concubines, and he had scores of children. He did have them. But here, the point that he may be making may be more of an exaggeration, all right? Some people's success may not come from their work, may not come from you know, their reputation may not be, wow, you work in this job, huh? Oh, wow, you have this reputation. Huh? Or, wow, you have this much money. Their reputation may come from the fact that they have children, from their family. Now, it could be number, as Solomon said. You know, I've met people with as many as 10 children, right? And that becomes their boast, but it could also refer to the success of the family. Some families, you know, they have that classic tripartite combination, right? Three children, you know, doctor, lawyer, engineer, and maybe if they've got a fourth one, banker, right? So their boast comes from these things. And, you know, sometimes these things give a family boasting rights. You know, people may, may say, whoa, how fortunate. He has many children that will plow the fields when he is old, that will provide for him in his old age. And, and that's why longevity and blessings and its blessings are another goal. Verse 3, as we read, and verse 6 speak of how a person may live many years. Verse 6 says, up to 2,000 years, 1,000 twice told, right? Now, of course, we do know that no one lives that long, you know, even in Solomon's day. But, you know, he could have been exaggerating to show that people value a long and fulfilling life. He may even have been referring to the patriarchs. You know, uh, Methuselah lived uh, 969 years, almost 1,000. And, you know, if God were to give double that, you know, that is seen as a blessing because people saw the antediluvian, the pre-flood saints, the pre-flood people as being blessed, right, with so many years. You know, it's like today, you know, when a person reaches 80, uh, 80 years old and they have their uh, 80th birthday, it's considered a milestone. You have a big dinner, you know, and... Uh, uh, it's wonderful, you know, when people come and they celebrate, especially if he is a self-made man. So that, too, is another goal that people may have in this life. Self-sufficiency, ability. All right, verse 7 speaks of how a man works, he earns, he supports himself. It says, all the labor of a man is for his mouth. So he has labored, he works, what he has worked for, he is able to eat. Right, he's not taking it from someone else. Right? All his labor is for his mouth. He invests, you know, he stores, he saves. You know, there are some of us you know, who can say, you know, I didn't get this from anyone else. You know, I worked from it. No, no, I did not have mom and dad uh, scholarship. You know, what I have, I earn. And, and this is a common goal that people have. We desire self-sufficiency. And for a great number of people, it is an issue of pride for them. So these verses here, they contain the common goals in life that people often seek to fill their lives, to give satisfaction. You know, how many of us here have dreamt this? Won't it be nice at my 80th birthday banquet, hosted by my successful children, who are not only loving, but they're professionals, you know. 
they come. They praise how wise and supportive I've been to them, how I was a self-made man. You know, we think that if we had all of these things that we will be satisfied and filled. So these are common goals to varying degrees. Now, for some of us, we may say, I hope I make it to 80. You know, oh, I hope my children will honor me then, right? But these are still aspirations. They're still goals. But what Solomon is saying is this. These things won't satisfy. They won't satisfy. That is why Solomon, secondly, uh, explores why we cannot fill our appetites. He says in verse 7, all the labor of man is for his mouth, yes, and yet the appetite is not filled. The appetite is not filled. Even though he works, he supports himself, he may be a self-made man, he has eaten, you know, what he has earned, but yet he is not satisfied. And Solomon says that this is an evil disease. Verse 1 says, there is an evil which I've seen under the sun. It is common among men. Verse 2 says, this is vanity. It is an evil disease. So dissatisfaction is an evil disease. It's like pica. You eat whatever, you know, you can't fill your appetite, and then you've got intestinal blockage and you die. It's like a goldfish. It keeps on eating and eating and eating. It dies. You have Prater Ville syndrome. They eat, they eat, they eat. They're never satisfied. Even garbage they'll eat. They die. The appetite is not filled. It is a common and evil disease. It is a hungry worm. It's the, for kids, it's the hungry caterpillar. You know, on Monday, you eat this. On Tuesday, you eat, you know, uh, two pears, three plums, five oranges, whatever. You're never satisfied. And the reason for this, Solomon gives, are two. We are dissatisfied because of bad circumstances. Verse 2 says, A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing of his soul of all that he desireth, yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof. So a person may be rich, but he has no power to enjoy his hard work. Why? I mean, all of us, all of us here who work hard, we recognize this, right? You work hard all day, you get back late, but you have no time to relax. You try and go to sleep, but your mind is just filled with work. You know, you run here, you run there. You know, a mother's work is never done, right? She does everything. She's like an octopus, and at the end of the day, she's so tired out. For some of you here, you go on holiday, but your phone still has a signal. You are still answering work emails, right? Where there's a signal, your boss can reach you. So you have no power to enjoy your wealth. And this is ironic because we think that wealth brings power, but rather wealth overpowers us. And what is worse is you may have a very good reputation as a worker. Ah, never mind, like he on holiday, just give it to him, he'll get it done. And you will get it done because you want to preserve that reputation. Now, verses 3 and 6, they speak of a man who lives long and has many children. This is a common goal, but it does not satisfy, because verse 3 reads, If a man beget a hundred children and live many years, so that the days of his years be many, but his soul is not filled with good, and also that he have no burial, I say, that an untimely birth is better than he. So long life is not necessarily a good life. You know, those of you who, who know the Chinese culture, the they have that uh, tripartite blessing, right? That goal, you know, of prosperity, status, longevity, you know, uh, symbolized by, you know, that bald man with the peach in his hand, uh, right? So we think that if we have all of these things, it will be good, but it doesn't always happen because of circumstances. If you are rich, but you're sick, that's not good. If you have a long life, but you have no status in life, you will also suffer. If you have many children, but no prosperity, you can't feed them. 
So long life doesn't necessarily mean good life, and many children does not necessarily mean a good burial. You may be buried by no one else but by the undertaker. You know, I think all of us know, right? All of us who have kids, our children blame us. You may die alone. So it's because of circumstances in our lives that we don't get to enjoy these things. And also, and importantly, it's because of a lack of understanding and perspective. Now, verse 8 says, For what hath the wise more than the fool? What hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? Now, I'd encourage you to study this. There are different ways of looking at this verse. But this is the way that I've come. This is the conclusion that I've come to. What does this verse mean? What is Solomon actually saying here? He's asking the question, what advantage does the wise man have over the fool? What? The same way the poor man knows how to walk in life. So if you are a wise man, what kind of advantage? How do you know how to live? The same as the poor man knows how to live life in front of the rich or, you know, in front of the world. The poor man, he understands that he should not be controlled by his hunger and his desire. He's been hungry for so long, it becomes a part of him, right? He is, he, you know, he knows that he can't be satisfied. He is realistic. He has a right perspective. He has even grown accustomed to accommodate himself to the circumstances. Ah, yeah, the rich will have their way. Ah, that's, that's the poor man's lot in life, right? So how is the wise better than the fool? The same way that a poor man knows how to walk before the living. And the problem is this, dearly beloved. The problem is this. We are not wise. We think that we can make it. We want to make it. We think we can be, you know, a millionaire or get this or that, right? And when you get it, you're going to be satisfied. But the poor man may know, you know, my, my children may not make it, and that's okay, right? But not like the fool. And that's a problem. We are like the fool. We think that you know, riches, a long life, you know, children, they will bring happiness, but riches alone does not bring happiness. You know, the rich young ruler went away sorrowing. You know, some think that children will make them happy, that it will save their marriage. That's why they have kids. Look at Leah. She had kids, but she was still not loved, right? Or it could be like Job, just hanging on to life. And dearly beloved, I know that the following illustration may be a bit sensitive, and it's in no way telling you not to seek medical help, but this is a common issue and a common problem. When serious illness like cancer strikes, we rightly get desperate. It's, it's part of the human condition. We try to prolong life, which is not wrong, but sometimes we cross over in our desperation where the life that we desire, the life that we want to hang on to becomes an idol rather than the sweet surrender of being in the presence of God. And so when that happens, when advice is especially given, what do some people do? They have all the amalgams from their teeth removed. You know, they will juice this melon or juice this vegetable. They will fill their bodies up. They will wear this kind of negative ion clothing. And I've known people who have done that because desperation is part of the human condition. We all want to prolong life. We think that having these various things will, will satisfy us. But the point is this. We have a limited time on earth. God is the one who determines it. And it's unfortunate, uh, we may realize it, but it's unfortunate that we forget this. 
We, we, we still think that long life will satisfy. And so, dearly beloved, I'm not saying don't try to prolong your life, but I'm saying, what I'm saying is this, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And that is a wise perspective, <laughs> not because it comes from me, but it comes from Scripture, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Or not long life, it could be things. You know, we, we, we spend years living and working and chasing after things. When a person reaches midlife, you'd think that he would have learned, but what happens at midlife, all right? Uh, he may think a new job would be better, or a new toy would bring satisfaction. And of course, there's nothing wrong with having a new toy, but the problem is this. We put our hope in these things to fill us. So if these things don't fill our appetites, what does? So thirdly, Solomon explores how our appetites can be filled. The first the first one is, is, how, is what we have been considering all of this time. The way to be satisfied is to look to God to find pleasure in what He has already given. All right, verse 9 says, there's wisdom from God. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This is also vanity and fixation of spirit. In other words, what you have before your eyes now, this is good. It is better than a wandering desire, wishing for things. Oh, the grass is greener on the other side. Let me see what the Joneses have. You know, and of course in Singapore, there are so many Joneses, you know, uh, so many Tans. I guess if you count, <laughs> never mind, All right? So what he means here is, uh, you know, th th like that proverb, uh, 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 a bird in hand is worth more than two in the bush. What you have here is good already rather than the two that's in the bush that you have not gotten. And so when Solomon uses the word desire in verse 9, he means appetite. So the good job that you have is better than the prestigious job that you don't have. The good life that you have now is better than the high life that you don't have, right? What you have is better than the appetite that is not filled. So therefore, be satisfied with what you have. You know, God has already given good gifts, right? More is not wrong. Wealth is not wrong, but coveting is. If God is our creator, that we would have no other gods before us as the bookend of one of the Ten Commandments, the other bookend is thou shalt not covet, right? Now, this is the same application in previous weeks. Enjoy what you have. But also, the reason we're not satisfied with what God has given is because in the end, we are not satisfied with God. You know, we look at all these laws of God. Thou shalt not this, thou shalt, thou shalt not be unequally yoked, thou shalt not be this, that. But what happens? Because we're not satisfied with God, we hate the commandments of God and we refuse to follow it like Eve why can't I have that fruit? Yea, hath God really said? Yaha, he said, cannot eat, cannot touch. And so when that happens, where we're not satisfied with God, this is when we will try and fill ourselves with things which are inedible, things that we cannot metabolize in the life after. Now track with me, verse 10 and 11. That which hath been is named already, and it is known that it is man. Neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he, seeing there be many things or words that increase vanity. What is man the better? Now, what is Solomon saying here? What's the principle here? Solomon is saying here, that which is named already is known that it is man is known to man already. He's saying everything has been determined. 
what every man will be, how rich, how old, how healthy, how many kids, how successful they are. Everything is known. It is determined by God the Almighty. There's no use debating with God for more. Right? Whatever is named is named already. It is... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Whatever man will be, it has been determined. You can't argue, can't contend with God who is mightier than you. Now, the word contending with him means to take to court. You cannot bargain. You cannot sue. You cannot you know, anyhow, goad God into giving you more. Now, what is the purpose of saying this? Why would a person want to take God to court? The reason that anyone would want to do that is because he is dissatisfied with God. Why are you never full? Why are you not satisfied? Why are you striving for more? It's not only because you are dissatisfied with what God has given, but you are dissatisfied with God himself, which is why Colossians 3 verse 5 says, covetousness is idolatry. And as I said, this is what Eve was guilty of. She was in a garden of great blessing. There was food, there were rivers of water, everything that she wanted, work, yes, there would be work, but it would be easy, but she wasn't satisfied with those things because she was ultimately not satisfied with God. And when you are not satisfied with God, you will not be satisfied with anything else. And dearly beloved, God has given himself to us. You know, when Job lost everything, he charged God with being unfair. All right to him and initially when he asked God all of these questions he received no answer and the way Job was complaining is very much the same way as Solomon here wrote everything that is known shall be known whatever happens to man it will happen what's the use of contending with God and if you were to turn to Job 9 32 all the way to 35, you might want to note down the reference. I'm not going to read it in the King James, but I'm going to read it in a way that I think we can all understand here. So verse 32 says, Job says, God is not a mortal like me, so I cannot argue with him. I cannot take him to court. And listen to his solution, the solution to his unhappiness. I cannot talk to God. I cannot bargain with him. Oh, I wish, verses 33, I wish if only there were a mediator between us, someone who could bring us together. The mediator could make God stop beating me, and I would no longer live in terror of his punishment. Then I could speak to him freely, but now I cannot do that on my own strength. <laughs> now, we New Testament believers, when we hear Job speaking like this, what's on our mind? Job! He has given you already, promised you a mediator. You want a man that will talk to God on your behalf to stop God beating you, to stop God from punishing you? You have someone already. You see, Job was in a condition like so many of us are in. He was dissatisfied because of what happened to him, what he didn't have, what he lost. You know, he lost his wealth, his family, his health, his reputation, all those things that are spoken about in Ecclesiastes 6. He lost all of them. The very things that he thought we think would bring us satisfaction. And to Job, God seemed as if he wasn't listening to him. And so Job thought he needed a go-between, someone who would make God understand. We know as New Testament believers, the mediator that Job wanted God had already promised him. God had already promised to give himself to Job. And when Job accepted that, 
You know, in the end of Job, when God revealed himself in all of his power, then Job realized that God is all-powerful. He is all that I need. Only then could he receive the good and the evil from the hands of God. When Job accepted, when he surrendered, that is when he received much more than he previously had. Dearly beloved, the way to have is not to strive. The way to have is to surrender. And all of us, we forget that. And that's why we strive to fill our appetites and they are never filled. So we find comfort in the mediator that God has provided, the Lord Jesus Christ. Problem with us is our eyes are often clouded by the things of this world that we have forgotten Jesus. We have forgotten that Jesus is the ultimate satisfaction. You know, in John 4, Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman. What did she have? Or what had she had? Five husbands. And even the man that she was with was not her husband. This woman was seeking love, continuing to seek after love, never finding it. Young people, <laughs> yeah, you're not going to seek love. You're not going to find it if you're not going to find it in Christ and his instituted ways. Full stop. Might be a semblance. It might be a semblance but you're not going to find it. She was looking for love in all of the wrong places, but when Jesus told her, if you ask of me, which I have the gift of God, I will give you living water, and it will satisfy. You know, there were people who were following Jesus because he offered food, 5,000 of them, because he fed them, but they continued to follow him not because they were hungry. You know, they were fed so much, there were 12 basketful left of bread and fish, but they were still hungry. They wanted more. Their appetites were not filled. And Jesus' words to them was, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus' solution was not to give them more. Jesus' solution was to give them himself. Why did Matthew follow Jesus so quickly? I mean, he had the tax collector's table in front of him making money, and even after Jesus said, foxes have no holes, or foxes have holes in birds' nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. But Matthew still followed after Jesus because Jesus could not give him wealth, but Jesus was enough and more than enough. And if Christ is really enough, if he is our inheritance, the one who can really supply all of our needs, then how does he factor in our lives? You know, do we find him sweet? Do we seek after him in prayer? Do we surrender to him to do his will? You know, one of the greatest tragedies I believe that we all see in the Christian church is this. We have Jesus, the creator of the universe, the one who created gold and silver, the one who made us children of God, the one who gave us eternal life, but we just won't be satisfied with him. We won't seek after him. And if we don't seek after him, we will not be satisfied with anything else. And so in conclusion, I have this to say, you know, for those of you who are ill, I cannot assure you of long life. You may not get better. For those of you who have difficulty at work, following Jesus may not remove that difficulty. For those of you who are lonely, following Jesus may, not, may never mean that you will have a spouse or family or children. And for those of you who may be struggling with a particular besetting sin, I can't promise you that in this life you will ever have complete victory before you die. Hopefully progressive, yes, but it may be besetting. But what I can say is this from the Word of God, that if you live by faith in Christ, if you seek after Him, He will satisfy you. He will satisfy you. You will be full. 
you will be happy with what you have. And you know when you surrender, you never know. He may give you more than what you desire. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. And so let us proclaim our satisfaction in Jesus as we eat the Holy Supper. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we listen to the words of institution, help us to recognize that Jesus is the only one that nourishes us and that so many things we seek after, they shall never satisfy. And so as we partake of the bread and the cup, help us to be convinced in our hearts. Help us as we take to make a resolve to give up that very thing, that sinful thing, that thing that does not satisfy, that we may give it up and surrender it to Jesus, who is the only one that satisfies. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.